My next guest is Dr. Brandon Beck. He is the author of Unlocking a Limited Potential, Understanding the Infinite Power Within to Guide Any Student Toward Success. It will be published by Codebreaker Inc. and released in November. He is a National Board Certified Teacher and holds a Doctorate in Educational Leadership. His primary purpose as an educator and a teacher leader is a simple one, to inspire people, adults and children, to have faith in themselves and believe in their inner genius. Dr. Beck's dissertation titled, The Influence of Professional Development on Teachers of English Language Learners, dug deeply into understanding teacher self-efficacy. He has been an elementary teacher for 15 years and a dual language teacher for the past 10. He is also an adjunct professor at Manhattanville College in New York, an editor and reviewer for AASA Journal of Scholarship and Practice, a regular presenter at state, regional, and national conferences. Dr. Beck also is a multigress teacher and national trainer. Uh, multigress is a program designed by Yale University's 21st Century in partnership with North Shore Animal League. The Multigress curriculum is an innovative pre-K through 12, 12th grade social emotional learning program that brings adopted shelter animals into schools. Dr. Beck is also an entrepreneur and professional soccer coach. He's currently a national, nationally certified instructor for the United States Soccer Federation. And is, in addition, he has coached teams that have won num numerous state, regional and national championships. Welcome to the podcast, Brandon. Thanks, it's great to be here. Well, uh, tell me a little bit about a story uh, about when you were in the trenches and how you managed to crawl out. Yeah, so first of all, that was quite a long bio. Yeah. So that was, uh, there was a lot in there. And, yeah. and one thing in addition to being a teacher um, is that I've, be, I've been a soccer coach and talking about getting out of the trenches is something that I do a lot with my players and my, in my, the teams that I work with. And so when I was thinking about that for this podcast, I thought about this one particular time, which was really an important moment for me as a coach and also gave me an opportunity to really reflect on the importance of values. So let's go back to 2017. 2017, my soccer team, my high school boys varsity soccer team was at the precipice of history. We were in what was called, what is basically considered like the county championship. So I'm a coach and a teacher in New York State. New York State is divided into 11 different sections and each section has its own championship. So to say it easily in the most simplest way, I'll call it the county championship. So there we were, it was a zero zero game. <clears throat> And we were tied after regulation. We went into overtime, 0-0. Zero, zero. Golden goal overtime, for those of you who don't know soccer, golden goal is first goal wins. Mm -hmm. So right from the kickoff, we have, uh, we don't even touch the ball. The other team comes, they attack at our goal, and they end up getting a corner kick. And they serve a, a high lofted ball into the goal area. And I'm sitting there with a perfect view. It's right in front of me. And my player jumps up, their player jumps up. Both half an inch on my particular player. And he heads the ball. And you know this is a podcast is not on, you're not going to, you may or may not see the video, but you can, I'm acting it out. He heads the ball and it hits the crossbar. And as it hits the crossbar, my goalkeeper looks back at the cross at the ball and without him even knowing the ball comes back so quickly, it hits him in the face. Mm -hmm. It trickles into the back. The other team like, an awkward pause by everybody in the stands, by the people on the field, and our season is ended. The game is over, one to nothing. My goalkeeper at the time, his name was Andrew Konofsky. He is on the ground face down, and all we can do is just run over to pick him up as a team, and our season is ended. So 
kind of hard to get through that moment as a team, but we did what we always did at the end of every season, take a week or two off and then back to work for the following upcoming season. I was fortunate at the time I had 17 kids that were juniors that were returning as seniors. So all of those kids and all of those players who witnessed that horrible experience losing in that huge game in front of family, in front of friends, um, in front of the community, um, they were determined to have another chance. So we are getting ready for the upcoming season. And it's in the spring now, I'm getting ready, I'm driving to a spring practice. And all of a sudden I look up into the sky and I notice a plane in the air. Mm -hmm. And I notice that the plane has a banner attached to it. And I'm like, oh, that's funny. It's around promposal time. So I'm, someone really went all out for this one and they're doing a promposal. I didn't think anything of it. I went, I coached the practice at a different location, not at the school. And I get home and I flick on the news. And when I flick on the news, I see that it was definitely not a promposal. And what it was, was that someone paid to have a plane flown over the school over the home baseball game and in the air was a banner that said fire coach smith and blah 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 obviously i'm using different names um and it was basically directed at the coaches it, of the baseball team of at the, at the school that i was a coach at wow. and i was just completely floored i was so caught off guard i was so upset i was I, I couldn't believe it and come to find out later on that basically what happened was a disgruntled parent whose child wasn't getting the plane that they thought they deserved and decided to fly a plane over the field. And I just couldn't believe how unreal and how unacceptable that was. Yeah. For, and I knew, I know the baseball coach and he's a really great passionate guy. Um, and both coaches actually um, are just strong coaches. They'd had championship after championship. So I really took it personally. Now I wasn't even the baseball coach. And this was in the spring. And I was just shocked. How do you even respond? And well, the, print, the superintendent at the time responded in a great way. So uh, the next day I'm driving home. I happen to live near kind of the school that I coach at. Mm -hmm. And I look up into a sky, into the sky, it's another plane with a banner. And this time I, I wasn't going to go home. This time I followed the plane to the high school. And I looked up and when I finally could get a clean view and it said the school that I coach at is called the Bears. And I look up into the sky and I see the banner and it says, let's go Bears. And it says the Twitter tag of the superintendent at the time. And the superintendent basically paid the same company that flew that plane to come and fly over and do a flyover for the for the game the next day rooting on the players and rooting on the the families and just that was just such an awesome moment for me to see that response because i, I didn't know how you would respond to that and such some leadership moment from someone who i really respect and someone who i i really think just did it the right way. Um, and so there we are, you know, this is obviously happening in the spring before our upcoming fall season. And yeah, I'm in the trenches. I'm upset. I'm sad. I'm frustrated. And what do I decide to do coming into the upcoming season? I have all these returning individuals is, is I really focus on returning to values and returning to, um, you know, what is it that we value as a coaching staff, um, as most important to teach our players, because this is so much more being a coach for me is so much more than just being a, you know, just some, being someone on the field who tries to win games. Um, and it's so much further beyond wins and losses. It's more about developing the individuals to become successful, to be able to achieve greatness, to be able to take their lives to the next level and be successful in life through sport as a team. And so every year I, I usually, you know, I usually have like a saying about the season. And so my saying this year going into the upcoming season was trust the process. Mm -hmm. And I wanted it to be clear during parent meetings. You know, I made it very clear how I felt about what had happened. Um, and I was open about it and I was disappointed. And, you know, 
I wanted parents, I wanted players, I wanted everybody to know that we were going to make an impact and as a, a, a collective unit to be able to, you know, show that as families, they needed to trust us, the coaching staff, to be able to guide the team um, to, the, to the right direction. And that was just kind of rooted in everything we did. And, you know, we also tied in, tied that into our values of, you know, respect, of teamwork, of family, of commitment. And we, we also wanted consistency because we had been in that final the year before and we really wanted to get there or do our best to achieve that level or do better than we did the year before. So fast forward through the season, 2018, my team, they had a tremendous, remarkable season and they clawed and fought their way back to the same place that they were. That same kid, Andrew Konofsky, was in the goal again. And we were back at the county championship. And this time we did not look back. We went up, we scored three goals. We won the game eventually. We won the game outright. We outplayed the other team. We had a tremendous game. And as soon as the whistle blew at the end of the game where we won the game three to two, we all ran to that goalkeeper, Andrew Konofsky. And I personally was the first one, I think, out there and I lifted him off the ground. Um, just an awesome moment. And, you know, that was just the county championship. So we continued on through the state tournament. We became regional championship champions. We moved on, you know, we, we went to the state final. Unfortunately, we lost in the state but we had been the furthest that I had ever been in my career and that we had been as a school. And we just made complete history. Um, and it was this whole thing the entire time that we were trusting in each other. And we weren't going to sit there and worry about our me time or my time and my time on the field. It, the conversation was always, how can we do better? And what, what is our, we all have our collective parts in this. And you know, the kind of culminating moment of this, this for me, which really, you know, made me feel that we really rose out of the trenches together was when we were driving home from the state final. Well, we lost, we didn't win the state final. Yeah. Um, and we are driving home and the community decided to give us a police escort. And we thought nothing of it at the time. I and mean, we were still sad about the loss. It was the same day that we had just lost the game. So we were all kind of defeated a little bit, you know, it's been a long season. And when we drive down the main street of the town, all of a sudden we start to look and there are kids dressed in their soccer jerseys mm -hmm. with their parents, with their moms, with their dads. And they're all out there kind of applauding us and cheering for us. And then we turn the corner and when we're going to the school after we get to the main street and there's just a giant crowd. And who's in that crowd? It's our families. It's all of our parents. It's everybody there who had been rooting for us, all dressed in the orange and blue, which are the colors of our school. And I was just floored. I, I literally was, I was in tears with my assistant coach next to me. We were literally crying because it was just such a, you know, it was so much more than the win or the loss, but it was that we as a program had come so far from that plane flying over, you know, one of the other sports teams and we really brought something back to the community. So that right there was, you know, just a moment that made me realize the importance of values and the importance of values, not only on the soccer field, but also in the classroom and in our schools and, and how they're really important to, to teach our, our students. That's such an amazing story. And that's something that, you know, would be a great movie, right? Because it's hard to believe that, you know, you guys came back after that first plane flew over, right? And that, that you had such good leadership in that superintendent who kind of just made that rebuttal just by saying, go Bears, right? And, and that that kind of propelled you for that next season, right? To have that saying about um, trust the process, making that clear to the community. Um, and then, you know, the fact that you maybe didn't win the state championships, but you got all the way to the state championships. And, you know, you really were able to elevate that MVP. Um, you know, the town was uh, celebrating you all. And it's just amazing how, you know, you, you and your team rose out of the trenches, right? And um, how that really taught both you and your players that life lesson about, you know, don't let people get you down. So 
I think, yeah, that's, that's really an amazing story. And I, I assume that you tell about this in your book as well, right? Yeah, I do. I okay. know I do tell about it in my book. It's, it was an inspiring story and, and it was, you know, just a really unique story in the way that it happened. And, you know, um, my book, um, it, which is coming out titled Unlocking Unlimited Potential mm -hmm. is really about, you know, unlocking the unlimited potential in us as educators, mm -hmm. first and foremost. And then that basically becomes contagious to everyone that we engage with and everyone that we teach and most importantly to our students. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, and that idea behind it is, you know, understanding who we are first and mm -hmm. foremost, you know, understanding our why, understanding our purpose, understanding, you know, that all of that comes from our story mm -hmm. um, is really important. And, you know, being able to identify opportunities in your school, you know, to set up, you know, a culture for this ability to unlock unlimited potential and that the expectations are the highest they can possibly be with anybody. And we're always going to face so many challenges as educators, as teachers, as mm -hmm. principals, as superintendents, and everyone, even even parents, you know, we're always, we're always sitting at the precipice of that history, you know, we're always trying to find out how do we achieve the highest level of expectations with our students. And if you don't have that understanding, that positivity, that that inside you, mm -hmm. then it's going to be really hard to unlock unlimited potential anywhere. Yeah, you talked a lot about how uh, the unlimited potential um, helps people become better, better educators. Um, and you talked a little bit about, about their drive and their passion in the pre-check. Can you tell me a little bit about how you've um, transformed, I guess you could say, as an educator uh, via coaching and how that's changed your passion in uh, becoming a quote unquote, bilingual educator who only speaks English, but is a bilingual educator. Tell me about that process. Yeah, so I am a monolingual dual language teacher. And for many people to hear that, they might kind of be like, wait a minute, that doesn't sound like it's supposed to sound. Um, and it's the truth. Um, we have, in the school that I teach, there is a 57% Hispanic Latino population. Um, and there is a dual language program that is just unbelievable. And when the dual language program was coming into fifth grade, it started pre-kindergarten with cohorts of students. Um, and when it was coming into fifth grade, they were looking for someone to take on the responsibility of being the quote unquote English zone teacher. So my responsibility would be the English side and there would be another teacher with me uh, in the other class, uh, that would be the Spanish side and, and we would flip flop. And so basically when it came through, I, I never second guessed it. I never, I never thought about not being the dual language teacher. It was just, my passion was, I believe in cultures. I love to travel. I love what, you know, what uniqueness that having different cultures in the classroom and that diversity brings. And I've always thought that that was such a special thing that I completely glazed over and looked over the fact that I was monolingual and I never thought anything of it. And so after being a, a dual language teacher for about six years, I was given the opportunity to present at a statewide conference. And what I had talked about with some of my colleagues in the school is they said, why don't you make a documentary? And I said, that's awesome. I love doing that kind of stuff. I'd love to do that. So the school gave me some time to go and, and interview some students in the high school. And I had actually taught those students when they're in fifth grade. So I was going and seeing them now in 11th and 12th grade, which was amazing. And just an awesome opportunity to see them so many years later. And I had a chance to go around the town, speak to community members and, and created this documentary. And I was at this conference getting ready to present. And there's all these bilingual educators there, gurus and so many people sitting there and they're referring to themselves as bilingual educators. Yeah. And I'm listening to this and over and over and I'm like, I'm monolingual. I'm not a bilingual educator. And all of a sudden it dawned on me and I don't know why it took me six years to figure this out. All of a sudden it dawned on me that, hey, wait a minute, 
I'm a bilingual educator. Mm -hmm. Just because I may not be teaching them in Spanish, which was the language of our dual language program, just because I'm not doing that, that I, I may not be using that. There's still other strategies and other skills that I'm using that make me a bilingual educator and that make me help them to work on both languages simultaneously because it's kind of like two wheels of a bike, right? It's not like I have one, but one of my tires is flat. Both of the tires are working. And I learned, I learned throughout my experience and throughout my process to, to be able to teach students um, how to be able to use what they have, what they have in their, their native language to help them with their, with their new, with their English, because I was just creative. I was innovative. I wasn't going to sit there and let myself believe anymore that because I wasn't bilingual or because I didn't have a certain certification mm -hmm. that I wasn't able to be a strong teacher of my students. And that kind of inspired me to take it to the next level. And I was in the doctorate program at the time. I was like in the first year of my doctorate program. And right there and then I had an epiphany at that conference. And I stood up at the conference before I presented the, the documentary. And I said, I just want to let you know, my name is Brandon Beck and I'm a bilingual educator. Mm -hmm. And I just realized that today. <laughs> <laughs> and so I changed my, I changed my, my topic of my dissertation to trying to, to see and learn if there were other people out there that felt the way that I did. Mm -hmm. And so I focused on my dissertation, focused on understanding how teachers of English language learners felt about preparation to teach English language learners. Yeah, it's amazing to hear like how you have that other journey, like you've, you've approached the bilingual uh, education as somebody who loves uh, cultures and you know, who, you know, is intent on teaching kids uh, better English. And, and, and in my opinion, when you don't know the language uh, that the students speak at home, it, it helps the kids learn English better, right? And we always think that, you know, every ESL teacher, or every bilingual educator um, knows Spanish at least. But I mean, I, I've taught that, ling you know, ASL, and I, I only speak a little bit of Spanish. But, you know, I think, uh, like you said, it's coming to that epiphany and saying, you know, you might not be quote unquote bilingual that you speak a second language, but you are a bilingual educator. And, you know, it's the strategies that you use that really uh, matter. And tell yeah, me I think it's the strategies. And I think it's also the belief. I think it's, yeah. you know, and I think this carries on not just into English language learners, but also special education, yeah. also to various places to challenges as we approach challenges. How do we handle them? You know, what's our mindset behind that? And if our mindset is you know, I can't do something mm -hmm. and you're probably not going to do it very well. But if my mindset is I can figure this out and I can learn to do it better, mm -hmm. then you are definitely going to have a much better chance because there is that drive. There is that passion. And it's funny, like after I finished defending my dissertation, the university that I did my dissertation at actually hired me to rewrite a course for teaching, um, educators that were going to be receiving their bilingual extensions and ESL certifications. So here I am, the person who's not bilingual, the person who doesn't have any of those certifications, and now I'm designing a course and working with educators to, that are going to go out into the field and they're going to become, you know, they're going to receive the certification that I don't have. And so that just kind of shows you in a nutshell, like the sky is the limit. And there, if we can figure out how to empower ourselves, mm -hmm. then we, the, the, then the opportunities are endless. Yeah, no, that's such an important thing to remember. Tell me a little bit about um, your original topic of your dissertation was uh, your thoughts on the teacher evaluation system. Um, and um, you decided then to change it um, to explore, um, you know, teaching um, uh, bilingual um, students. But uh, tell me a little bit about what your thoughts are on the evaluation system and maybe how it has or hasn't changed in the past um, maybe 10 years or so and how the COVID crisis may, may be able to change the evaluation system for the better. Yeah, so, you know, when I first started out, it was just around the time where in New York State, they had just came up with the policy that was going to link student performance and teacher evaluation to a score. 
mm -hmm. uh, rating of teachers. And I was just furious. I was just absolutely uh, just in, upset about it because how could we take how could we take teachers and put them in a box and how could we give them a label and how could you know as i started to dig deeper and deeper and deeper i started to see so many inequities inequities between districts that were highly funded that had you know 99% teachers that were highly effective and then district districts that were underfunded that were you know, had a little bit different scoring and then districts that were really like vigilant about the process yeah. that had all different, you know, levels of, of scoring of their educators. And there was just so many inconsistencies. And I swore, I, I swore to myself that I could really change the world yeah. with teacher evaluation and I could come up with a system. And I didn't give up, but I did read a book by Linda Darling Hammond called Getting Teacher Evaluation Right. Mm -hmm. And after I read that book, I closed the book and finished and I said, there are just so many variables. And Linda even agreed that it is such a subjective thing to be able to put a teacher in a box and give them a label. Yes, teachers do need to perform. We do need to do our best work. How we evaluate that and how we score that is very similar to the same way that we score achievement for our students. There are so many variables and, you know, is the is the teacher who shows up to my my personal child's soccer game on a weekend spending her own quality time is that teacher better than the teacher who might be like really engaged and really strong in in a certain level in a certain kind of instruction how do you measure that you know and and what is most important and so i was just kind of floored and taken aback and i said you know what like it's not about fixing teacher evaluation, mm -hmm. it's about empowering teacher self-efficacy. It's, and, and that's, that's what I discovered. You know, I did study the perception of teachers of L's, but really what I was, really what I learned most about was this idea of how do we develop self-confidence mm -hmm. and how do, you know, and that's kind of what my book is about. And that's kind of what my my platform has become is I consider myself a self-efficacy expert. How do we develop people personally? How do we develop them professionally? How do we create professional development that focuses on making sure that the educators in that professional development walk away empowered and walk away fired up and with their fire lit, ready to light more fires so that we can make sure that our schools just are empowered by learners and empowered by people who believe in themselves and that character education piece. So that's kind of where it came from. What do I think COVID provides us for evaluation? COVID provides us an opportunity to look at things different and it provides us an opportunity to look at our teachers differently. Um, how quickly can teachers learn? How creative can teachers be? And, you know, the words that I keep hearing over and over and over again are creativity and innovation. Mm -hmm. And if we really believe that creativity and innovation are at the forefront, well, let's take ev the word evaluation for a moment and let's just remove that from the conversation. Yeah. Let's focus on making sure that our teachers are empowered and ready to rock and roll. No, I think those are great words to, um, you know, talk about and the fact that we are we don't want to evaluate them necessarily like we would, you know, assess a student or give students standardized tests and that the whole thing about tying uh, teacher evaluation to student scores on standardized tests, you know, that was uh, really fought um, in, in many states throughout the US. But like you said, it's about innovation. It's about looking at the creativity and how teachers are planning their lessons and executing their lessons in uh, the remote or the hybrid environment that they're working in right now. And, um, you tell me that there's a chapter in the, your book um, that kind of talks about when one door closes um, and tell me a little bit about what that means to you. Yeah, so I'm super excited about this. So, you know, I'm always looking at, for silver linings. I'm always, you know, trying to focus on the positive um, in moments of darkness, I guess, so to speak. Yeah. And one of the chapters in my book that is the title. When one door closes, a virtual one opens. And instead of having me write the whole chapter, what I did is I reached out to educators from all over the North America. Um, and I basically ended up having them write about what is their 
silver lining? What is the silver linings that they discovered as educators? And it's really exciting. You know, there's podcasters, there are principals, there's superintendents, there's teachers, um, and there's even people who are just keynote speakers and, and consultants and, you know, people that are out there doing a different type of educating than being inside the classroom. So it's really been a, a unique opportunity to be able to take their, their reflections and put them all together and make them fit. And it's an, a chapter that I'm super excited about because, you know, during this time, it's very easy to focus on what we cannot control. It's very easy to focus on, well, the what if, what if this happens and what if that happens? And, you know, nobody really has the answers. And so it's a really uncomfortable time for people. And it's even a more uncomfortable time for educators. Like this is the first time that education is, was really at the forefront of everything that was happening in the rest of the economy. Like everybody, parents were waiting on pins and needles, waiting for the decision. Am I going to be have to stay home? Am I gonna be home half the time? And am I gonna, is my kid gonna be in school? And really it was a real reminder of, hey, education matters and how we do it isn't going to be perfect. And we may have a lot of critics out there that think it should be one way or the other, but at the end of the day, it goes back to that whole idea of trust the process, right? We have to trust that our educators are doing their well-intentioned service and that our teachers are going to do even more. Like, mm -hmm. I know that I'm not perfect. I know that my, the people around me are not perfect, but I can tell you that we are going to work very, very hard to make this a unique learning opportunity for everybody that is engaging and that is helpful. Like I'm tired of hearing like, oh my God, the kids are gonna be so far behind. Well, no, they're not. They're not gonna be far behind. They're gonna be able to still do things. And that mindset of saying that our students are gonna be far behind isn't good enough. Yeah. And we can do so much better. And I, and I believe that you know, with patience and with persistence and with creativity and with that innovation that this could be better in some ways and you know it could make us do things differently when we actually return to full-time in-person you know instruction in that new normal yeah yeah and that's how we need to look at we need to look at it in a positive light and not just think about what you know kids lost out on in the spring or you know um what might occur right during remote or hybrid learning what you know we're looking at the innovation and you know more personalized learning today than what students were uh, getting before March of 2020. So um, yeah, it's definitely looking at it as um, the innovation and the creativity that we can uh, contribute now that we maybe weren't able to, um, you know, work so much with before because we were so much in a box and, you know, so I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, your, I don't know if I pronounce it, multi-grass, multi multi-grass <laughs> training and uh, the program that you're working with in uh, the social emotional learning and bringing a uh, comfort dog to school this coming year. Um, so um, tell me a little bit about that process and um, you know what what uh, what kind of dog you're bringing? Uh, is this your own dog and what kind of training did the dog go through? Yeah, so that's a that's another awesome story and it's actually referred to as mutt e Grease. Okay. <laughs> a little bit, which is a little bit confusing, but it, it's because of, you know, there, it's the word mutt is because the dogs that are involved in this program are usually shelter dogs, adopted dogs. So it's a funny story. And it started with a time, a time for kids article that I read with my fifth grade students like three years ago. Uh -huh. And it was about this program, Mud Agrees. And I read it to my class and it was about how these dogs were in classrooms and they were following this curriculum and the curriculum is put out, is designed by Yale University's school for the 21st century. And Cesar Milan, AKA the dog whisperer is also one of the people who helped write the curriculum. Um, I'm actually super lucky. I was actually on a, a training the other day with Cesar Milan um, okay. and he was talking about education. It was amazing. Um, he's just an awesome, awesome guy. And um, so, of course, after I read the article to my students, what's the first thing they ask? Oh, can we do that? And I <laughs> looked at them and I'm kind of like, 
are you guys crazy? Like, what do you mean? Can we do that? I don't have a dog. I didn't have a dog at the time. And I got home and I read the same article to my two daughters Uh and my daughters at the time were, they, you know, they're right now, they're 10 and six years old. And so this was like two years ago. And of course my dog, my kids had been asking for years, just like any little girls or any kids normally do is they were asking for a puppy anyways. And I thought that I came up with the brilliant kind of happy medium and my family became, um, puppy socializers for an organization called Guiding Eyes Mm -hmm. and Guiding Eyes for the Blind. If you don't know, they basically have dogs that they train to be service animals to people with disabilities, blind um, and other disabilities. So I'm thinking I have this happy medium. The whole idea, we go and take this class to be puppy socializers and it's you give it, you bring home two beautiful black lab, yellow labs, German shepherd puppies um, for four days Mm -hmm. and it's crazy. And they're usually their first time out of the kennel because these, they just keep churning animals in and out. They just have such a need throughout the country. And so I learned kind of through the process, just a little bit about how to take care of an animal and a dog. And, you know, I thought that my wife and I thought we were winning parenting by, by coming up with this happy medium. And sure enough, when I read that article to my kids at the time, they were like, well, we're kind of ready. Let's, let's do this. And so I went to kind of mulled over it for a couple of days and I went back to school the next day, the, the next day and my students were just really kept asking. And I was talking to my wife and talking to the kids, my kids. And I said, you know what, I'm going to reach out. I'm going to reach out to Jane Vitale, who was the person who runs Mud Agrees. And sure enough, she's like so inspirational and just loves her job and loves this program. And sure enough, I get her on the phone and she talks me through it. I'm all fired up after the conversation and I'm all ready. And and she's like, so what kind of dog do you want? (laughs) I was like, well, just, you know, let's pump the brakes and, you know, let's just see. And so I'm like, well, I do, you know, if I, if I do this, I want a hypoallergenic dog. You know, I don't want to have a dog that I have to worry about allergies or anything like that. And now let me just remind you, there are many of these animals across the country that are not hypoallergenic that are in schools. And I'm thinking like, I I love Labradoodles and I love, you know, all the different kinds of doodles that there are out there. And I just think they're a cool dog. And I was like, all right, let's, you know, it's, I would like something like that. And so she's like, okay. Now the idea is that the the organization that is linked up with the curriculum is the Pet Savers Foundation and North Shore Animal League, which is an animal shelter locally. And so I get this information to her and she says it usually takes about three to six months. Now it was January, I was like, perfect. I'm a teacher in the summer, this will work out. I'll be able to train the dog in the summer. Well, sure enough, she calls me three days later and she's like, Brandon, what do you think about a poodle? And of course, what does everybody think about when they hear a poodle? Yeah. They think about that dog with the puppy butts and the, the foo-foo haircuts and the, the show dogs that we always see. And I'm kind of like, I don't know if that's me. She's like, Brandon, trust me. They're awesome with kids. They'll hike with you. They'll run with you, whatever you want. And they're one of the most intelligent animals. So I started doing some research and looked up and sure enough, I, I'm doing this research by the way, right now with my students in the classroom because they're watching the whole process. When I wrote the email to, to Jane, we wrote the email together. So I, was, I wanted my students to be involved in the process as much as possible. We wrote letters to our principal, to, we wrote letters to the superintendent. We get the, I, and, and so she sends, I'm thinking about this whole process and I'm thinking about this idea of having this poodle and I go home and I tell my wife about it and I tell my kids and you know, we're kind of just not ready. You know, we weren't really ready to make that commitment. And then she sends me a video at like nine o'clock that night. And what, what they do with the dogs is they take, them in, they take them out of the shelter and they take them into a school for like a behavior analysis to see how they'll do. And sure enough, she brings the, the video is this little 13 week old black poodle, standard poodle. So it's not a little dog. So a standard poodle laying on its back with its paws up in the air. And there are about 25 hands petting. And the dog is just laying there. I'm like, is that a real animal? Is that a statue? Is that stuffed animal? She's like, no, that's, that's the dog. That's Peaches. That's the name of the dog. And I said, all right. I said, 
uh, I'm convinced. I'm going to come see this. I'm going to come see Peaches this weekend. It was Martin Luther King weekend. We went and saw the animal, brought my daughters. They were so excited. Peaches comes out. My, and just starts licking my kids' faces. She's so gentle. She's an awesome animal at the time. And she just, we fell in love. We took her home. We took her home. And little did I know at the time that like what the process would take. I personally invested in training for the dog, for, for Peaches, because I wanted to make sure that she would be, this would work. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we wanted to make sure with my, I have to give a lot of credit to my school district, to my superintendents, when I had a meeting with them, I'm like, guys, we have to have a meeting because tomorrow I'm going to see this dog. And if I don't go tomorrow, I'm not going to get this dog. And they're like, are you sure you're, you're going to get a dog and, and you're going to you're going to like own this animal and you're going to you're going to bring it to the classroom. And it was like we had to do all this talk to the lawyers and all these different things. And I was like, yeah, that's what I'm going to do, because the, the curriculum was aligned to social emotional learning. Yeah. And there's a whole curriculum behind it. Mud agrees is a fantastic curriculum. And I. You know, I had read through the curriculum and I'd seen the curriculum. You don't actually, the curriculum is written that you don't even have to have an animal in the classroom. Mm -hmm. It's about animal behavior. It just helps if the animal's in the classroom. And so sure enough, I, you know, I, I went and, and took on this process. I wrote a grant that was funded by a local organization to be able to kind of house the animal and, and to kind of make sure that she had what she needed and all of these different specifications about it. And man, it was, it's, you know, fast forward like a year later after that and what an unbelievable opportunity. I mean, first of all, Peaches is my best friend. Mm -hmm. um, we, she runs trails with me every morning um, and she's soft and fluffy and she's about 45 pounds. So she's like a medium sized dog. And my students, I cannot explain to you the impacts are endless. I will give you one small story about one student. I, it, it, when she first, when Peaches first came in the classroom, I had this student at the time who literally had like no affect, he had no face impressions. We had no idea like what, what he was thinking. We always tried, you know, we worked with him as much as we could. He definitely had some small social emotional needs. Mm -hmm. And the, fir the first day Peaches comes into the classroom, the students are sitting around a circle. And it was, and I, Peaches just kind of walked around in the circle and she walked up to this kid and she just looked down next to him. And I was like, thing her and he smiles. And I was like, goosebumps. Like, I was like, this is, this is the smallest, the small, um, but just so amazing to see and you know fast forward to where we are now we had to work through like little piece of day to get her to a full day now she comes into the school with me twice a week she works with over 100 students each day oh. I have a before school mentor program I went to the principal and I said give me the kids that are on the list. And she's like, what list? I was like, you know, the list. I was like the list of kids that you always see in your office. Give me the list of those kids. I want to go and I want to invite those kids in the school. She's like, you do? I'm like, yes. She's like, this is an awesome idea. Let's do it. I said, not only do I want to invite them to be my mentor program, they're going to come to school an hour early to do the mentor program. So I get this list of these students. I tell them about the program. They're super psyched. They're super stoked. And I have the students coming to school an hour early every day that they're there they're there sometimes there before me opening the door some of them take a cab their parents put them in a cab to come to school so that they will not miss it and when they come to the mentor program it's an awesome opportunity because in that mentor program it's character education it's being that creating that group therapy i guess so to speak environment we take peaches on a walk we teach peaches tricks we talk about oh wait a minute when they're teaching Peaches a trick and she doesn't do it and they're getting frustrated, hey, that's interesting. You're teaching the animal and you're getting frustrated that she's not doing what you want her to do. I wonder how your teachers feel. I wonder, does <laughs> that ever happen? Oh yeah, it does. And we have this kind of check-in and we, we, we created this program. So she comes to school early, she does that. She works in my class, she works in another class. She then goes and works with a pull-out reading instructor. 
Now the pullout reading instructor reports to me every day. She's like, Brandon, she, the students used to dread coming to my classroom because they thought they were getting like help. She's like, Brandon, they now meet me outside my door with smiles, with excitement. And you can follow me. And if you see on Twitter, you look through my Twitter feed, you'll see, you know, a lot of, we do post every day that she's in school. And, you know, now what we're dealing with is we're dealing with going into COVID and, you know, this virtual environment during, during the end of school, what I would do is I would get on the video chat. I would get on the, uh, the zoom call before, before class actually started for 15 minutes. And I would just kind of get on the call and just talk casually. I called it chill and chat. Yeah. I ca would talk casually with my students and I would be doing tricks with the dog and, and showing them tricks. And we'd be talking as, you know, the dog was doing things and we'd be talking about, you know, how is Peach feeling today? What are some things you notice? Oh, her tail's wagging. What does that mean? You know, reading that body language and relating that to, to human connection is, is really interesting. So she, she works with about a hundred students a day when she comes to school, which is awesome. And, you know, I, I have teachers knocking on my door that want her in the classroom. I have teachers that come to my classroom just to hang out, to pet her, to see her, because it just, just, you know, it, it, it what it does, it, it, it really gets that oxytocin firing in our brains you know, even like it, which is like the same as like when we see pictures of babies or even just seeing a picture of an animal makes people happier. And when the students come into my class, we always say this, it's business as usual, because this is a really important opportunity that we have. We don't want to ruin it by being crazy and acting nutty around this dog. We want to make sure respectful of this dog is in our, we are a family together. And it's when the students walk into my classroom on the day that dog that that peaches is there it's it's unbelievable it's just so much progress and so much positivity they really feel like it's their dog and it's just it, it's been one of the most memorable experiences that i've had as an educator wow yeah this is an amazing story to hear about how you uh, you know found out about this just by reading that time for kids article right you know, I've, I've read Time for Kids articles as well, and just kind of putting that into practice, right, and, and having that, um, you know, constant demand, I guess you could say, from that, those students uh, before it actually be, came to fruition, but, you know, Peaches um, just kind of has, has integrated with your family and, you know, is able to go on runs with you and, you know, is really um, loved by the school, so, you know, hopefully, um, whatever, you know, hybrid environment you all are starting out with, she'll still be able to go to the building those days that you're in school and, you know, we'll be able to work with these groups of kids because it seems like, you know, um, this is something we, we didn't hear about people doing until maybe, you know, the last three or four years, right? But um, it, it's really showing benefits by having these dogs in the classroom and um, kids seeing, you know, picking up on dogs' behaviors and then you're, you're saying you're comparing you know, if the dog doesn't do what you want it to do, well, how do you think the adults feel when the children don't do? So I think that's that's really a good parallel. And um, yeah. looking forward to um, seeing posts um, of her um, in the classroom uh, throughout the year. And we'll make sure I'll put a note in to have people check out Twitter to, to see pictures of her. Well, this has been a great conversation today on the podcast. Out of everything we talked about today, what's one thing you especially would like listeners to remember? I just think that just as we embark upon this quest of being educators, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's going to be insurmountable forces. There's going to be, you know, critics and things that are far beyond our control. And there are so many things that we can control. And there's so many things that we need to remember and things that we need to remember is we need to remember our story. We need to remember why we do what we do. Yeah. We need to remember our purpose. And I say this to a lot of the educators that I work with on a consultant basis um, is your purpose should be somewhere in your classroom or in your school or in your office. Um, and I try to put it on, on my, behind my door in my classroom. And I try to, I try to spend like a minute or two before students walk in the classroom, just reading it. I read it. I close my eyes. I read it out loud to myself. And in just, it, if you understand your purpose and you are these forces of challenges and problems or self-limiting beliefs or conflicts come your way, if you remember your purpose, you'll be able to make any game time decision 
that is for the positive development of all students and including the yourself, you're going to take yourself and you're going to take your learning to the next level. And you're going to be able to unlock that unlimited potential in all that you work with. Wow. Those are really, really great words to remember. And uh, we look forward to, um, you know, having your book available. Uh, will that be available on Amazon and through your website? Yes, it'll be avail available on both. It's coming out in November. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people can find me at Brandon Beck EDU. They can find me on Twitter. They can find me on Instagram. You can find me on Facebook, Brandon Beck. And you can also find me on my website, BrandonBeckEDU.com. Great. Well, thank you so much for being on the Out of the Trenches podcast. Have a great rest of your day. It was my pleasure. Take care.